Hey everybody, it's Norm from Tested, and today I'm gonna to be reviewing Microsoft's Surface Studio. It's one of the most exciting PCs I've seen in a long time, and surprisingly, it's made by Microsoft. Well, maybe not so surprisingly, because over the past couple of years, Microsoft has been doing a lot of interesting things with their Surface line. I've been a big fan of what's become of the Surface Pro tablets, what that has evolved to, and also last year's Surface Book. And maybe the surprising thing is that the newer Surface product is a large touchscreen all-in-one. And when you think of an all-in-one PC, you might think that this is a competitor to Apple's iMac, for example, or other all-in-ones in the PC space. And this is not that. The closest thing this is a competitor to is maybe Wacom Cintiq, a large screen digitizer made for artists to draw directly on and use in their work. Uh, but the big difference between the Surface Studio and a Cintiq, of course, is that there is a computer built in. So today I'm gonna to be talking about this product in its three individual components. The big, large 28 inch touchscreen and digitizer, the computer that runs Windows and all that software, and the hinge that connects them together. The first thing I wanna talk about is the Surface Studios screen, this massive display. Yes, it's stupid thin and it's stupid big and it's crazy gorgeous. But the thing that impresses me most, the thing I like the most, is how it takes advantage of this 28 inches diagonal. It's actually, like the Surface Book, a three by two aspect ratio display. And what that means is that it's little more square than a 16 by nine or a 16 by 10 aspect ratio screen you'd find on a traditional large screen monitor. And being a little more square, you're gonna get more square inches, more surface area. It's 23 and a half inches wide and 50 and a half inches tall. And combined, you get over 364 square inches of usable touchscreen. That's significantly higher than the amount of surface area you'd get on like a 27 inch 5K display. Now inside that space are 4,500 pixels by 3,000 pixels of resolution, 192 DPI. Now why is 192 important? It's not the highest pixel density we've seen on a screen, but 192 importance for Windows because Windows was written for 96 DPI for the longest time. Dialog boxes, menus, and many legacy applications. At 192 DPI or PPI, you can pixel double, meaning you can run Windows 10 at 200% scaling and not get any of the visual artifacts or text dithering that you might see with Windows at non-integer scaling, 125%, 150%. And at this size, screen size, and at that DPI, when you hold up a piece of paper, one inch in the real world compares to one inch on screen at 192 PPI. Running Windows at 200% scaling, you're effectively using the screen at 2250 by 1500 resolution times two, which is high enough not to have Windows feel cramped. Text and images do look super sharp, even up close. And up close is important because this is a computer and a screen that I found myself getting really up close to. That's how I ended up using this. It's not far away, it's not several feet away, it's really in my face because it has its touch and pen capabilities. Just like on the Surface Book and the Surface Pros, I love using touchscreen in Windows to complement my use of the keyboard and mouse for scrolling web pages, for tapping dialog boxes, and even hitting send after writing an email. Touch adds just that little bit of convenience to the little things that enhances the overall experience. But of course, this isn't just a touchscreen. It's a digitizer made to work with Microsoft's Surface Pen. The same pen that was released last year on the Surface Book and based on the Ntrig digitizer technology that Microsoft acquired a few years ago. And what does that mean? It means it's pretty great as a digitizer. Just based on my own experience, I couldn't detect any notable visual latency and the responsiveness was great and the accuracy was precise enough that I could draw very small or very large and take use of that pressure sensitivity. 
But what do I know? I'm not an artist. So what we decided to do was bring in some artists who do use Wacom Cintiqs as their daily work tool and draw for a living. One of the artists we brought in was Marty Cooper, a friend of ours who's a cartoonist and a storyboard artist. And the first thing he said was that he loved the screen size of the Surface Studio. He thought that the responsiveness of the Surface Pen was not any better than last year's Surface Book, but really good latency compared to his Cintiq. But something Marty did notice in the Surface Studio and in the Surface Book was a phenomenon where the pen would register marks before the tip of the pen actually touched the screen. And you can actually notice it. When you hover the pen above the surface, you can see a little cursor. And then some programs will actually start drawing before the pen touches the screen surface. Now for him, because he moves his arm really quickly in drawing his lines, he would get these little small hooks or tails at the beginning and end of his lines, which he said wouldn't be acceptable in his professional work environment. The other artist we brought in to test the Surface Studio is Clara Hummel, an art director and game developer at a local game studio. And she's been using a Cintiq for a decade and draws regularly in Photoshop. She also loved the size and the resolution of the screen, which means that she didn't have to zoom all the way in and pixel peep when she was trying to do fine detail work in her artwork. Clara thought the latency and the responsiveness of the Surface Pen was great and didn't have any issues with palm rejection, which is important to her because she actually draws left-handed. But she thought the subtleties of the pressure sensitivity on the Surface Pen weren't as good as on her Cintiq. Light touches didn't register as well, and she also wished that she could program the button on the Surface Pen as a right click. In fact, both Marty and Claire wish there were buttons on the screen or on the pen that you can program to use in their applications. Both of the artists we had come in test the Surface Studio mentioned how much they love having the screen canvas this big and the colors looking that great. But both also had small quirks that they would consider to be deal breakers. Connected to the screen is a hinge and a pretty unique hinge. It's no small feat of engineering that this is what allows the 13 pounds screen to live on top of the computer and then also rotate down to about 20 degrees. And I found that anywhere in between the 90 degrees vertical and 20 degrees all the way down, you would actually still have a lot of stability. You would be able to tap the screen, draw on the screen, even rest your arms on the screen and not have it wobble like you would a laptop bent at that angle. And even though the hinges, the two points of the hinge work together so you can't raise it up and then bend it over, the artists that we talked to had no issues with that being a limitation. They were still able to work at any of these angles. And finally, let's talk about the PC portion, the computer part of the Surface Studio, the brains of the operation. My biggest reservation about the Surface Studio was that you had to buy it with a non-upgradable PC attached. And thankfully, the computer here doesn't feel underpowered for a display of this size and resolution. In our review units, we have a system equipped with Intel's Skylake processor. It's an Intel Core i7-6820HQ, which is a 45-watt quad-core part. Our system also has 32 gigs of RAM and NVIDIA's GTX 980M. The base unit has an NVIDIA GTX 965M. Now, the biggest questions we had about the Surface Studio was why didn't Microsoft put in Intel's new Kaby Lake processors and also NVIDIA's new Pascal chips. And my guess is that the design of this PC part, this chassis, constrained the parts that Microsoft could put in it. They couldn't just swap out Maxwell chips for Pascal chips and Skylake parts for KB Lake parts without changing the thermal design of the system. Remember, the Pascal chips, even the GTX 1070, uses more power than the laptop-based 980M. Now, performance-wise, the Surface Studio is still a very capable machine. I was able to edit photos in Lightroom and Photoshop and videos in Premiere Pro effortlessly on this machine, though for video edits, I would still want to attach a second display for media management. The smoothness of video editing and the time it took to render and export clips was pretty in line with my expectations for a quad-core system, on par with that of a high-end desktop, but not of a dedicated video editing workstation. Gaming was also respectable on the Surface Studio. The GTX 980M handles games rendered at 2250 by 1500, 50% resolution, really well, like 
Call of Duty Infinite Warfare or Battlefield 1. And on this screen, even pixel doubled, those games looked fantastic. But don't expect to be able to play games at the native 4.5K resolution. And while technologies like Oculus's new asynchronous space warp features let you technically run virtual reality on the Surface Studio, that isn't the point of this system. And trying to run VR on this only highlights the fact that you're spending north of $3,000 on a PC that delivers far from best-in-class PC performance. Also, like the Surface laptops, the ports here are a little limited. There's no Thunderbolt 3 or USB-C. You do have Display Port for an external monitor, four USB 3 ports, Ethernet, an SD card reader, and a headphone jack, but they're placed in the back of the system. And I thought that was an inconvenient placement. That's a result of Microsoft choosing the beauty and niceness of the system over practical functionality. It's kind of an Apple move there. There's also the Surface Dial, a new accessory that works with all Windows 10 PCs. Developers can tap into the Windows Wheel API and let the dial command shortcuts like scrolling through your edit history or undoing and redoing. By default, it works as a brightness or volume knob for your Windows, but it can also use for scrolling through web pages and has nice haptic feedback. Dial is also a button, but that button isn't programmable by the user. And I wish they added more buttons either to the top or the sides of this accessory. Now, when paired with a Surface Studio, supported apps will recognize the placement of a dial on the screen and pop up an on-screen menu for shortcuts like changing color palettes. But outside a few applications that partnered with Microsoft to directly support the dial on Surface Studio, it's not something that's gonna change how artists use their existing tools today. These on-screen shortcuts for the dial are also designed for right-handed users holding the dial in their left hands. So left-handed users who hold the dial in the right hands aren't able to see them. Surface Studio is easily the most beautiful computer I've used, and it's definitely the closest anyone has come to building a giant interactive digital canvas for consumers. But it's definitely not for everyone, and I can't even say it's for all artists. But for those artists that can take advantage of this technology and make money from their art and art as their livelihood, it's a game-changing innovation. I think this is an aspirational tool. It's a piece of technology that's a benchmark for what computers can be. And frankly, it makes me wish I was an artist and that Microsoft would sell the screen and the hinge separate from the PC so that I could take advantage of something this cool.